we are live now yeah Okay, let me start. Yeah. Hey, hi everyone. Uh, very good evening for all of you for joining our webinar uh, with our expert uh, uh, Satyajit, who's the product head, strategy head from Google as such. Uh, thanks a lot, everyone, for joining. And we have got today people from different time zones, right? We have got people coming in from Asia Pacific, Singapore, Malaysia. We've got people coming from Middle East, Dubai, uh, Dubai, Qatar, Saudi Arabia. We've got people coming in from Africa, Europe, North America, right? So this is a truly international webinar as such. And as you guys would be knowing, we have this uh, international webinar once in a month, in the third week of uh, every month as such, right? And we invite different experts, different stalwarts from the industry, uh, uh, different personalities from the industry, right? So last few days, we had webinars on data science, we had webinars on machine learning, MBA, and today we are having a webinar on product management and strategy, right? And we have got none other, none other than the best in the business, right? Mr. Satyajit Salgar, right? So he is one of these stalwarts. He's worked in Google and YouTube. Uh, so welcome Satyajit to our webinar. And thanks a lot for taking out some valuable time uh, from your busy schedule uh, uh, to make yourself available to all our learners. Welcome. Uh, thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, let me introduce first Satyajit to all of you, right? Just give me a second. I've just prepared a huge introduction because uh, I would not be able to memorize that. Uh, such, are, such are his achievements, right? So. Let me talk about Satyajit, right? Satyajit is an executive with deep experience building products and businesses in an intersection of tech and media, right? And he has led a number of product management teams at Google, including teams responsible for Google Discover Experience, uh, media on Google search, which includes TV, movies, uh, books, games, music, etc. Also Delight, right? Delight, which includes doodles, Easter eggs. And he's also developed core, uh, Google, uh, core, core search UI and Google Knowledge Graph, right? So that's what he's done at Google. As well. Tremendous achievement so far. Like. And before that, in his past roles, he has worked at YouTube, right? He's worked on gaming, payments, and ads. And apart from this work, which he does, right? He also likes to mentor people, right? He mentors people, advises startups, and teaches and conducts guest lectures, right? And uh, because of this, all things, he's there with us. He wants to have an interaction with all of you, like, the guest lecture, he wanted to teach you something which he already has done at Google and YouTube in his previous work and share his experiences, right? So that's about his work experience and his hobbies. Coming back to education, right? He's done his master's in computer science from Stanford University and MBA in strategy, marketing, and finance from the University of Chicago, right? There are the boot schools of business. Like, I mean, he's got a very good uh, pedigree of education as well, right? So I'm very sure you would have a great experience. Now, coming back to our webinar today, right? Our webinar, if you look into, it's more about product management strategy, right? So he's going to discuss about product management strategy and why this fails, why people come up with various strategies and why you need that fail. And he has got some very good stories, anecdotes to share with you guys, right? I am very sure you would enjoy the session. So that's more or less about, uh, about our today's session, about our today's guest. So the agenda of the session would be, he would take you to the entire PPT deck and he'll interact with you as such. And at the end of it, we'll have some uh, discussions with him, maybe a coffee with him and some uh, some heart-to-heart uh, -heart questions about his work experience, about how is, how a day day in the life of a uh, of a product management uh, product manager is there in in Google, and he'll share lots of experience, right? So uh, so so stay tuned for a fun session today with him, like yeah. Uh, uh, so this is just before you start, like there's a small poll we want to take, uh, when we want to understand what is the background of the learner, so that you can interact them accordingly, like with your due permission, of course. Sounds great. Okay, so uh, we just started the poll, guys. Uh, I, I, I think you can see the poll on your screens. So if you can just uh, share the details uh, uh, in this, right? So Satyajit would understand that what are your backgrounds, uh, what are the outcome you're looking for the session, and accordingly he can uh, uh, guide this session as such. And, and one caveat, like uh, today, Medha Narang was supposed to be the moderator for this session. Unfortunately, because of some medical reasons, she has to back out and that's why I am there instead of her. So maybe you might be surprised like 
why the why the chain so i just thought i'll just mention this thing so yeah so uh, so yeah keep the keep your uh, answers coming in so what we can see through the uh, today's poll is majority of people are from 6 to 9 years of experience right uh, roughly around 27 percent of people are from 6 to 9 years of experience we've also got good number of people at a very senior level 15 plus years of experience okay then there's some people in 10 to 14 years of experience also so we have got a mixed pool of people majorly we got senior professionals 6 plus years of experience but we have got a younger generation as well and apart from that what is the outcomes that these uh, our uh, learners are expecting is uh, they want to understand how is pm shaping the industry right most of the people want to understand that also people want to understand upskilling myself in this topic and domain right how can they upskill themselves in this topic and domain and the next pool of people they want to understand is whether i can build my career uh, as a product manager yeah, fair enough so uh, i hope uh, that so you would have a fair understanding about our today's uh, target audience the learners as such no that's super helpful i mean i'm impressed there are lots of people with like so much experience actually on 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 the talk so that should be fun right, right, right. Uh, i'll look forward to the questions yeah 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 so so jit over to you and then uh, uh, you can start with your interaction with the learners yeah yeah and i'll i'll keep my um i'll keep the chat window open as well so if folks have questions in there i'll try and answer them as as i go along right right um, so so let me let me share uh Let me share my presentation. Okay, okay, okay. Let me go from there. Uh, hopefully, folks can see my screen now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's it's visible. Your screen yeah. is visible. Yeah. Cool. Um, so so this is uh, uh, this is a topic I've given a few times. I've adapted some of the stories uh, uh, stories for this audience. Uh, the topic is you know five tips for a better better product strategy. You know what are the things you can do um, to Product strategy is a hard topic. Uh, I don't think you can sort of be amazing at product strategy right away. But what are the five things you can do to get to a better product strategy? Um, so I, I always have an obligatory. Uh, what do I? Uh, why should you listen to me about this topic? Slide. Uh, I've been fortunate to work on many products for a long, uh, for a really long time. Um, I, I have had the opportunity to work on a few products now that have been you know billion plus user 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 products. I've also worked on a few products that have failed and we've had to shut down. Um and I've had a chance to learn from uh, many people at like different stages in their career. So uh I've been lucky enough to work with people that have taught me a lot about how to think about product strategy. Um and so I'm happy to take questions or or sort of share more about that as I go along. Um so I'll start by saying uh I'm not going to talk about the other aspects of product management today. Uh, but i will say like i i feel very lucky to work in product i think it's an amazing job um but with it you know i'll i'll sort of uh to quote you know sort of uh, spiderman uncle with it comes great responsibility um and in my mind product strategy is is one of the core tenets uh of of doing this job well um you help decide you know what is it that your team is doing what is it that your company is doing what is the thing that you are pushing forward i think it's an amazing opportunity and responsibility um the first thing i will say uh is is there is far more bad strategy than there is good strategy um i'm actually curious uh, feel free to either put it in the chat or 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 um like how many people feel like their either their their teams or their products have like great product strategy That's a hard question, man. So let me let me let me let me give you my hypothesis on this. Um, I think most strategy that you actually have is bad strategy. Uh, and there's a great book that I recommend on this. It's, it's called "A Good Strategy, Bad Strategy." Um, and I think the key to avoiding the key to having a good strategy is to avoid bad strategy. Uh, so the first thing I always tell people is recognize when you're seeing bad strategy. Um, and the best quote I've heard on this. is is sort of uh i've seen this time and time again so i'm going to i'm going to quote one of my early sort of uh projects uh where um you know the mistake that people often make is they they conflate vision ambition or inspiration uh with the strategy and those are not those things 
Uh, for example, I was once on a project where you know I talked to someone who is uh, very senior on the team, uh, had done really well, was a very charismatic leader. Um, and I said, okay, you know, what is what is our plan? What am I supposed to do? I'm a, I'm a new PM in the field. How do I think about executing on this? And uh, this person kept anchoring back to, we are going to be the number one player in this field. Uh, we, when people use our product, they will feel amazing. They'll come back to this. They'll feel, they'll they'll sort of like our job is to make this company and this product win in this market. And he was very inspirational. And so you know, I I had. Uh, he was a very senior leader. It was very rare to get, you know, uh, half an hour with him. Um, and I sat and I w went out of that room, like sort of energized. Uh, I was so excited. I was like, oh man, I'm going to do this. Then I sat and thought about it right after, like, you know, right after the high went down. And I realized, oh, I actually have no idea what to do after that conversation. Uh, because it was very inspirational. And, you know, like, let's, let's win the market is great ambition, but it's not a strategy. It's not a plan. It doesn't tell you how to make decisions. Um, and that is the key, right? Like the first thing I think, you know, sort of I would look at when you look at your strategies, company strategy or your product strategy, if it's something that is really a vision or an ambition, uh, put it away. That's not your strategy. You don't have a strategy yet. Um, so you will often see things like be the best player in the market or like hire great people and provide outstanding service or like, like things of that sort. And I've seen this time and time again with companies and products. Um, all of that actually doesn't help you make decisions. It doesn't tell you, know, you as a product manager, engineers, the entire team, how do I actually do something? Do I do X or Y? Um, and so now let's talk about you know, what is it that that good strategy is. Um, good strategy, once done right, is really, really simple to articulate. Uh, I have two great definitions uh, that I've heard and, and I use with my team all the time. And I, and I think, um, you know, I think they're worth sort of everyone looking at and internalizing. Uh, the first is by Gibson Biddle. Uh, it basically asks, whenever you, part of your strategy should clearly answer the question, how will your product delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? Now, each of those words is really important. Uh, delight customers. So to the point where, you know, they, uh, the example he always uses uh, is around Netflix uh, in this in this case, uh, because he spent a lot of time there. Um, but, you know, what is it that your product will do, your service will do, even your feature will do, that will make your customers really, really happy. And, and note the word delight there. It's like really sort of delight them, make their life dramatically better. The second part is, is hard to copy, um, which is, it's not impossible to copy, like most, most things aren't, but you have some advantage, you have some insight that makes it really hard for a competitor in the space to get there right away. Um, and sometimes that advantage can be scale, other times it can be technology, other times it can, it can be something else, some other competency you have. But you have to have a clear understanding of that. And then I think without knowing, you know, how this helps your, your business model, like, and that's the margin enhancing part. Um, the, the whole thing doesn't connect properly, right? So I think having that entire picture in is really, really important. Um, and so the first part is I'd say like when you sit down to write your strategy, like have a sense of when I'm done with this, does it answer this question? You know, do I now know how I'm gonna delight customers in hard to copy margin enhancing ways? Um, the second part is, um, I have this great definition by, by Adam Nash, right? which is, he wrote this a long time ago. It's one of the first things I read as, as a product manager, which is your job as a product manager is, especially as it pertains to product strategy, is to define what is the game you're playing, right? Like, are you trying to win the market? Are you trying to win the share of this? Uh, why will you win? You have to clearly define saying like, okay, what is the game I'm playing? Um, what is my plan um, and how are you keeping score? So this is about metrics and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that, but at any given point, it's really important for you not just to define your strategy, but to sort of articulate why, how do I know if my strategy is working or not? How do I have a clear sense that this is the right thing to do? Um, so these two definitions, I, 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 I sort of strongly encourage everyone um, uh, to, keep, uh, to keep in mind. And, and the, the best strategic plans are really sharp 
really insightful and really short, right? So that's the thing, right? Which is, it doesn't have to be like, you know, this amazing sort of long research paper. Like I've often come with, come with folks. Uh, I think it shouldn't be a PowerPoint generally, right? Like strategy paper should be a written document, it should be thoughtful, it should cover the market um, and it should cover why you will win. But it can be a memo, it can be two pages. Uh, the best plans are, so So the plan I reference over here is actually, so Elon Musk has probably written the, the two best versions of this. Um, so he wrote uh, this thing, which is, you know, the secret Tesla master plan. He wrote it as a public thing in 2006. Um, and what's remarkable is, so he also has an updated version, I think uh, in 2000, like I think 15 years later, right? So, so I think he's, he's updated it now. Um, uh, or maybe actually like a couple of years ago, he's updated. But this plan basically worked. So it's a two-page thing outlining why he thought Tesla would work, what the plan was. And he basically said like, you know, this is it. And at the end, he summarized it, right? Just build a car, use that money to build an affordable car, use that money to make an even more affordable car. And then, you know, while doing so, provide zero emission electric power. He kind of said this, and that's more or less what they've done over, you know, a decade-long period. Um, and he was very clear on that. and explain why the advantages were there at every single point. Um, I think it's, you know, aspirational. And that's what I tell most folks on my team to write, which is when you're writing a strategy, write up front what your assumptions are, why you'll win and how you'll keep score. And it can really be a short, short document. Um, having said that, uh, you know, it's the thing I will say is even though the document itself is short, right? Like the document itself can be fairly brief. Uh, the process itself is 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 not right. Like uh, getting to a great product strategy is can take an insanely hard amount of time and can be a lot of work. Um, uh, again, I, I there are many books I recommend around kind of sort of what to read and how to think about it. Um, but the thing I'll say is is uh, if you read good strategy, bad strategy again in particular, uh, they talk about iteration and just uh, realizing that a large part of strategy is saying, okay, this thing in, in my market is not working. This other competitor is doing this. Um, so it's really, before you sit down to write your plan, you have to make sure you understand the market really well. You understand trends really well. You understand yourself, your company, your abilities really, really well. And you diagnose the problem uh, on at every level uh, before you're able to articulate this. And this stuff is hard. So um, I'll, I'll talk about... Google Photos, which uh, hopefully a lot of you use Google Photos today. Uh, it's an incredibly successful product, uh, works really, really well. Some of my most magical memories have sort of come come from Google Photos. But it took the team a really, really long time. In fact, even before what you think of today as a Google Photos product and even the Google Photos team existed, it took us, uh, Google as a company, years to sort of figure out what the right angle was, right? Because it was clear that you know people had a need for photos um, but the current experience that Google provided wasn't great. But, you know, it took years of sort of rewriting what the assumptions were, figuring out what the plan is, getting the right people in place, understanding the advantage that we had, understanding the distinguishing factor. Uh, and so I would say, like, um, I was part of the Google Plus team, out of which, you know, the Google Photos effort spun. Um, and so it must have taken about four or five years before even the current iteration of the product started getting built, like, let alone sort of, become the awesome thing that, is, that it is today. Uh, so be prepared for time and sort of space to like get this right and, and expect that it will be effort and that you'll have to put a lot of energy into it. Um, the one thing I will say, like once you get the product strategy right, and what is critical to get the product strategy right is to get the metric right. Um, so I'm a very big believer in a single North Star metric for for most product decisions, not, not all of them, and I'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, but having this one single metric that helps you keep score and drive focus, drives focus for the organization is really critical. Um, and the reason sort of uh, to have that one single metric uh, is that it helps decision making on every level, right? So for example, if someone comes to you and said, should I build this feature or this feature? Should I think about this thing or this other thing? If you have this one single metric, you can point at it and say, you know, will it move this metric more or will it will it move it less? And that becomes a way to make decisions. Um, and so that's really the, the point of view of a metric, right? It'll help answer most, not every, actually I think I have every in the slide, 
over there. I would say you should answer most prioritization decisions for your team. Um, and the reality is that the reason all of this is very important to articulate is uh, you need product strategy to seep through an organization. Uh, it's not just you that sort of will make each of these calls. Like a lot of calls will be made by people that are not you, um, especially if you work in a large company. Uh, and it's really important that they have this metric and they have this methodology to be able to make these calls. Um, so the story I often tell here is about YouTube. Um, so YouTube in 2017 published a blog post, right? And they said, um, uh, we now met this audacious goal of 1 billion uh, hours watched every single day. Um, and it's a, it was a crazy goal. The goal was set almost, you know, I think five years before. Um, and all of this happened before, before I got to YouTube. Um, but, but I got to see the scale as, as sort of some of this ramped up. And what was amazing to me is how clear decision-making and strategy was, right? It's frankly one of the most impressive things I've seen. Um, you know, at the time, YouTube was like a thousand person engineering team. Um, and because everyone had this metric in their head, right? Which is, we are, every decision we make moves watch time, right? That sort of was the goal. So, you know, if someone comes in and said, okay, I'm gonna do this thing, I'm gonna change the algorithm in this way, uh, the question that you know the leads asked or or the engineers on the team asked is, oh, will this will this move watch time? How much will it move watch time by? Um, and you know if it moved watch time more, uh, you that was the project you worked on. If it moved watch time less, you didn't work on that project. Uh, and so really, this just filtered through the org, and everyone made decisions based on that. And it's kind of remarkable what happened, right? Like it's remarkable to see. Um, Essentially, you know, at the time when we when people projected out what would happen to hit a billion hours a day, effectively you were creating more traffic than the internet as a whole could take at that point, right? So it required everyone in internet infrastructure to change, the player to change, even just how like the internet itself worked really needed to sort of be revamped. Uh, and we were able to do this because everyone sort of asked a single question and everyone was very focused on one goal, which was driving up watch time. Um, and so again, like I, I, the one thing I do sort of say is, is you should think about uh, this metrics framework very clearly, have a single metric, uh, have, especially because uh, if you're building ML systems increasingly, uh, you will have this process where, you know, you need to sort of optimize for one thing and having that be a clear thing will often give you these amazing wins, which you aren't even anticipating. Uh, because the machine learning systems will sort of find things that even you don't think about. Um, the flip side of that is uh, it's a little dangerous. Um, uh, uh, it's a little dangerous to sort of um, rely only on one metric, right? So a lot of people will say something like have a control metric. Uh, so, so for example, um, the story I've often heard is you know, a lot of, for example, an e-commerce company, uh, their North Star metric would be something like GMV. So everyone will focus really hard on driving GMV, but people forget to look at profitability. Then suddenly one fine day they realize, oh, we're really driving GMV, but our mix of goods is such, or our choices of algorithms is such that, you know, profitability is really low. So in their case, you know, profitability should probably be a control metric for GM, GMV. Um, so having a sense of, look, if I go really, really well on my North Star metric, some other thing which may go south. Uh, am I keeping a watch on that? Do I sort of understand why that's happening? How do I how do I mitigate that? Is really important. Uh, so one of my favorite frameworks is actually the one I have on the screen. Uh, it was published by by a team at, at Google internally a few years ago. It's called Heart, and it's more of a sort of holistic way of looking at metrics. Um, and I do recommend people do that in addition to a North Star metric. So. Um, so have a North Star metric, optimize for it, but also measure other things associated with it. So HARD stands for happiness, engagement, adoption, retention, and task success. Uh, and so there are different ways to measure each of these, you know, engagement, adoption, retention, you can sort of measure it as part of the funnel and keep track of it. Um, but happiness and task uh, success are really important consumer metrics to measure. Uh, happiness in terms of just, you know, either uh, a CSAT score or an NPS score, and task success literally just, you know, a survey that says, hey, what were you trying to do? How easy was it to do it? Um, so you have sort of a sort of quantitative, but sort of qualitative feel for how your, your product is uh, going along as well. Um, so these two things are really, really important as you think about 
um, sort of a metric to keep in mind. Um, so the final point I'm going to make and sort of uh, I'll bring back some of these things is um, is actually I'm going to tell a story. Uh, so this is uh, I'm going to take you right at um, I'm going to I'm going to take you right to the beginning of my career as a product manager. So I've been doing product management for uh, now almost you know uh, I've been doing product management for about 12 years now, a little bit more. Um, so my first job was what was on then Google Payments. It was called Google Checkout. Um, and I was, you know, sort of new to the job. Uh, I'd been maybe a PM for about six to seven months. Uh, and so this was around, you know, sort of, I'd say like 2009. Um, and I was in an interesting situation where, you know, I, I, I was, I was, uh, payments was in a very different place in 2009 than it is today. Like today it's a really well developed, really active market. Uh, at the time it wasn't right. So there were, there were relatively few people, uh, in there. So this isn't like a Google logo that you see on the screen. It's a it's a logo for for Venmo, which is a peer to peer payment app uh, that's really successful here. Um, but at the time, I was on Google Checkout, and um, Google had the ability to do this. Right? It had this ability for people to pay from one uh, one person to the other. Uh, the economics were a little off, but but you know I had a lot of conviction that you know hey we know how to do this. It's not very hard technically. We you know most of the bones have been built. Um, we should do this. We should build a mobile app that lets people pay to each peer to peer, you know, pay each other for 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 things that they need to do. Uh, we should uh, probably start on college campuses. Um, and this was exactly at the time, you know, this company called Venmo was was it had just been founded that exact year. Um, and I was like, oh, you know, like we should do this and we should take it forward. And and I wrote. And I wrote a strategy doc. I had a plan. I sort of tried to sell it to people. Um, the thing I realized, right, is there was a lot of history at the time with a, that the team that I'd worked with had tried a version, not quite this thing, but they tried like peer to pay payments before. It had been really hard. Um, and so even though I had this plan and had written out a strategy, I wasn't able to convince people that, like, oh, you know, the strategy that I've written and, you know, that I've come up with is actually something that as an organization we should go implement now. Uh, and so, you know, sometimes you have really clear strategy, but you need to understand why does, you know, your team not buy it? Why does the market not buy it? Uh, why do people that, you know, you sort of uh, have convinced uh, of other things, why don't they buy that exact thing? So a really important job of, you know, of once you develop your strategy is being able to sell it. Uh, to understand why people might be hesitant to remove their sort of objections. Uh, so for me today, right, like I, whenever, whenever, um, whenever I'm paying other people or parents uh, in in sort of uh, other parents, uh, especially around my kids' school, uh, everyone sort of you know sort of says, oh, you know, can you give me a Venmo so that you, I can pay you? And it always rankles me, right? Which is as like, wait, you know, if I had been slightly better at selling this and convincing people. Maybe they'd have been using, you know, something, uh, something that you know I, I had come up with instead of, instead of Venmo. Obviously, Venmo has been an incredibly successful product. Uh, and so that's one of the things I, I often tell people, which is, uh, it's part of your job once you develop a strategy to sell it, to get people to buy in, uh, which sometimes is almost as hard as coming up with the strategy itself. Uh, so it doesn't matter, you know, if you can't sell it, uh, what your strategy was. Uh, that was that was my talk. I had, uh, you know, sort of five quick things I wanted to get through. But I know there are lots of questions. I see them see them coming in, so I'm happy to take uh, questions uh, either on the topic or around it or 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 anything else uh, around that. Um, so Amod has a question on: Can we take a situation uh, for this? So, hey, hi, Sitaji. Hello, can you hear me? Oh, Anand, I can't hear you, but I think you're speaking. Yeah, can you hear me now? Hello? I can now, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, there are quite a few questions coming in from the learners, right? As in they're coming from different backgrounds as such. So there are quite a few learners from a tech background, right? So they want to understand that tech plus strategy, right? How would this work in the product management context? Like, I mean, that's what they want to understand. So I think there are two things, which, which is um, your job as a PM is to, number one, define the strategy and then sort of say, 
convince your team and execute on. So from a product management perspective, there are a couple of things I would keep in mind. One is, I think what's different about tech product management is, um, you know, most product management is you understand what consumers want, you understand your market, and then you start executing on it. The thing with good technology product management is it's really important to understand technology and how things are shifting. Uh, so some of the best examples I've heard are, are from friends. So for example, years ago, I would talk to friends in, in uh, augmented reality and VR, right? And I would ask like, what are you doing, right? Like, this, like I don't understand this market, what is happening? Uh, and one of them said the most insightful thing. He said, look, we're not building for now, we're building for five years from now, right? Like a lot of the hardware that needs to change, a lot of the software that will be available, we think it will take at least another five years uh, for, for this to work. But the question is, while you're building for that five years, how do, what do you build, what do you ship so that you're in a position that you can win five years from now? Um, and so that's the way I, I'd say where technology product management differs is it's all the other parts of product management, you know, understanding customers, understanding markets. But the third element is understanding technology and how it evolves which is really hard because, you know, unlike a lot of things, you know, technology very rarely sort of, is it a linear curve, right? Like it tends to be a little bit of a, at some point, you know, it's a hockey stick and it's exponential. So understanding that part, right? Which is how do I buy time so that this thing can be successful is, is really important. Um, so I'd say that's a big, big thing on, on where tech product management is, is a little bit different. Hey, thanks, thanks for that, Satyajit. I think I think most of our tech learners who are today as a part of our webinar or attending our webinar, they would have got good insights like how products, product strategy and product management would be relevant to their roles per se. Thanks for Satyajit. Thanks for that. And also thanks for having a wonderful presentation, right? Lots of stories, examples, and insights as such. Uh, another question uh, is coming from uh, people from different backgrounds, right? There are people from different backgrounds like biotech or BFSI or yep. manufacturing, right? So just want to understand that if they want to start their career into a product strategy, like as in uh, so, some, something similar to what you have started and you've reached now, right? If they want to go the same career path, like uh, what would be advice to them as such? Yeah. So let me, let me talk a little bit about my path and then I'll give you advice for other. Okay. Other okay, okay. Yeah. Fair enough. Just, Your journey. Like, yeah, so I think traditionally, especially in tech product management, right? I think there's this general idea that you either need a computer science background or you need a sort of a business background coming in. Right? Like, and I think that is a very common background for a lot of PMs. That's that's my background. I, I used to be an engineer. I was at a startup. Uh, I tried a couple of startups of my own. Um, uh, went to to uh, to business school, and then I when I started at Google, I started in partnerships, and then I moved to product management. Oh. Um, so I think so. That's one background. But I would say like increasingly, I'm seeing good PMs come from all sorts of backgrounds. Um, I think initially there was this idea that the reason I think you know people liked product managers, the technical background, was the idea is you wanted someone who could you know understand what engineers were trying to build well, have great conversations with them. I think over time people have understood how to do that. So now the other skills are more important. Right? Like for me, increasingly, it's really important that a product manager have great business instincts. If it's something very specific in an industry, for example. At Google, we have a few product managers in the healthcare space that are doctors, right? So it's because they understand that space really well, they understand that market really well, and they're applying that skill. Uh, increasingly, some of the best product managers that I work with have a design background, which is so that they're not technical, but they've spent a lot of time in, in design and sort of they have a better understanding of uh, sort of what what emotionally connects people, like they have pixel things. Um, and increasingly, my view is is the best PMs um, rarely have very specific, like they don't need to be good at, like most PMs that I know are like are really good at one thing, but the really important thing is they're, they have breadth, right? Like they're able to like understand design, they're able to understand technology, they're able to understand the customer, and they're able to do, do these things that develop consumer empathy really well. So to answer the question of you know people that have backgrounds that are not uh, traditional tech backgrounds, um, I would aim for and I think the question that that someone had was like that you know they've got a, a background in microbiology and you think, and they want to sort of go to a health startup. I think that's the right way to think about it, right? Look at spaces where your expertise is really important, 
uh, and so you can uh, you have a foot in the door. But the thing that you then need to convince people, especially as they're interviewing, is okay. Do you understand what it takes uh, to build a product in the space? Uh, so think about okay, what is so then I think there you have to start thinking about how do you show them that you understand customer needs? How do you understand? How do you show them that you know I I have what it takes to sort of push things forward? Um, because as a PM, right, you know, those are your two things, right? You're trying to understand the market really well and the customer, and then you have to prove that, like, you're able to actually drive things forward. So, showing in your experience when you've pushed things forward, when you've actually made a difference, I think is one good distinguishing thing. Um, and then, you know, in an interview, be prepared to show that, like, look, I can think about what people need, how they need it, uh, how do they get it done? Like, I think that's the stuff that's really important. Okay. Okay. Thanks, thanks, Satyajit, for that. That would be really helpful for our learners coming from non-tech background as such. Satyajit, one more question, right? Cyril is asking that uh, you mentioned in your slide, right, uh, where you spoke that strategy is, isn't about vision, right? And then in Tesla, uh, you aligned it to its vision, like right? so. He just want he, he just want to understand more yeah, about yeah. this part, like yeah, yeah. Yeah, I yeah, know it's a good question. So I, I think vision is important, right? Like, don't get me wrong, right? I think it's really really important as a company and and sort of. Uh, um I, I think people need vision so let me put it that way right like the the key to realize is is you know most of us are like humans need to have the sense that we're working for something big right like it's not it's not an, it very rarely are you going to motivate the best people by saying oh you know come in get paid go home right like they want to have this idea that we're building something amazing so vision is really important it's important for a company it's important even for a product to say okay this is where we're trying to go uh but i think what's different is vision is not a strategy right right which is so for example you know i think saying you know i want to be an amazing place to work right i want to sort of be um i actually i'll personalize the example right it's fine for me to have a vision that says i should be in incredible shape right i should be really fit i should be really sort of uh like you know i should be in really great shape that's not that's fine but what is my strategy to get there and right. you know w- and that involves a few things right it's it's not only saying okay i'm going to go to the gym i'm going to eat better etc it should be a step lower that says okay a diagnosis okay why am i why is that not happening today what's going off like why is this not working right and i think that's the difference between a strategy and a vision right which is you have to understand what the the sort of the reason stopping you from achieving your vision are and have a realistic plan for how to solve it right um and i think the part that i that i that i see most companies do is that they mix strategy and vision right so you you'll often talk to i found founders and like people that say oh i'm i want to win this market i'm going to be even when we talk about hiring right i want the best people to come and work for me like okay but why will they work for you right right what is the plan like are you are you saying you're going to give them better benefits will someone else also do that like so you have to have a sort of you have you have to have a plan and i think that's a big part of strategy right it's it's a very crisp plan that you can sort of hand to any person and they can make decisions based on uh and so that's the difference between a vision and a strategy it's a good question sorry i went off for a while no no that was completely okay like it it was really insightful like thanks thanks a lot and even even cyril is happy for this enli- enlightenment as such yeah. yeah thank you as that that was useful yeah yeah so uh, next question is coming from shrimanta right what what he or she uh, wants to understand is uh, you mentioned about product success right but along with product success there are some unknown outcomes also right so uh, so he wants to understand like how would you take care of this unknown outcome like that's what uh, you want to understand um so this is like so i guess when when uh, when you say unknown outcomes this is like things could happen like unpredictability right. Mm-hmm. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, i think that's always a risk right like you so the one thing i will say is product strategy is not static right like you can have a plan based on your current understanding of the market but i, I think one of the reasons to have a metric is to say is my strategy working right so so you can sort of make a bunch of assumptions right sometimes people can have an amazing product strategy and they get unlucky right like markets turn something it happens um you know i uh, there's someone i know who i thought had a really great travel startup idea uh and it was distinguishing all of those things then then covid hit and 
we never will know whether right you know that was a good idea or not um and so things can happen that you know invalidate your strategy um but i think the the main thing over there is to keep keep looking at okay i had a bunch of assumptions uh based on my assumptions if i do everything correctly and my strategy is working this metric should move is that metric moving um even if that metric is moving you should sort of take a minute and say okay is everything that i believed still true and have i learned new information that would make me adjust what i believe um so i think the thing to keep in mind is is product strategy is not like you do it once and you're done it's it's uh it's actually sort of evolving you have to keep working at it uh you have to plan to make it like most of my product strategy documents that i i i sort of put a line on top saying this is a this is a living document so it's not done uh and so so you sort of keep iterating on it um uh, uh, especially like certainly product plans i sort of always have that disclaimer right because you want to revisit them and and, and iterate on it iterate on them yeah thanks 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 for that that's the deep Asid, um, uh, the learners also want to understand your journey, right? I'm, uh, I understand that you mentioned it uh, before also yep. in past. Like, but if you can just uh, tell everybody, right? Because they would be also aspiring to become someone like you, like over a period of time, right? When you did your masters, your MBA from the top-notch uh, schools, uh, top-notch global schools, right? Uh, and then probably you got into Google, and then you got into product management. How you've grown in the hierarchy over a period of time, right? And uh, so just your journey, basically, if you can share with everyone. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I'm happy to. So, so I, um, I did my bachelor's in computer engineering from from Pune, and then I okay. went at the time again. I I sort of, uh, I think it's a function of the time when I was graduating. If most of my friends were also trying to get to the United States for a for a graduate degree in computer science, so I was like, okay, I should probably do that. Um, and then i think once i got here i i, I wish i the thing I, i i enjoy now especially about sort of people is they're much more planned in their careers i think in my in my case it was a little accidental right which is um i started graduate school um i thought i was going to go work for one company uh, but this was around you know two, uh, 2000 i think i was graduating to um, 2002 so the dot com bust had happened and the company that i was going to go work for was like oh we you can't join us right now okay, let's okay. come back in like a few months right uh, and so i happened to go join a startup that my mm-hmm. prof- that a professor that i knew co-founded um and you know sort of i worked there for a, for a while i tried one other startup on the side and it didn't work out but like it gave me a sense of like it was in many ways probably the best thing that could have happened to my career because you know i joined when i joined again the company was 20 people okay it gave me a sense of like okay this is what it takes to build something this is what it what it what it is required and i remember when i left that company to go to business school it was over 100 people and it was just about to be acquired uh, but we still didn't have a single product manager so i remember just as i was leaving this person joined and she was going to be the first product manager and i asked one of our eng managers like what is what is the product manager what do they do and and the guy said oh you know they help us understand how what to build like so i was like i was like who's been doing that job now he's like oh right now all of us have sort of been doing it i do some of it the ceo does some of it like <laughs> okay. it's a little all over the place but like this is this is the job um and so that was the first time i heard the job and i and i remember thinking oh this is an interesting job um but after business school i i joined google i joined it in partnerships uh um and then i it was around then after about a year at google that i realized given my interests and background uh product management was probably something i would really enjoy because it it has this nice intersection of you can think about business you can think about technology you can think about what to build um it's also a position that i think in tech companies at the time gave you a lot of flexibility and authority and i realized that about myself i like i like moving across different things trying different things uh it's also a position that i realized much later requires you to influence people and requires you to be able to work with people and enjoy working with people um which i had not thought i would like but i i i did uh and so once i made that switch i i've been in product ever since and at google i've actually worked on many many things uh so i started out working on payments uh, as i mentioned um uh, i then started working on before that like in partnerships i worked on youtube and then uh in tv ads so i sort of tv ads is when i transitioned um then i i worked on games first on google plus which was a social network sort of competitor that we had at the time 
Uh, we built the mobile version of, of games on Google+, Plus, which became what today is Google Plus Games. Um, uh, so which, which became today what is Google Play Games. So if you're on an Android phone and you have Play Games, that's I was one of the founding PMs of that. Um, uh, then I went back to YouTube. Uh, at YouTube, I started live streaming at YouTube. Uh, and then I became the sports and news PM. Uh, and then since then, I've sort of uh, been on search. So I've done many different things on search. I, um, I've i mainly also worked on sort of uh, media on search. So TV, movies, music, books, games, events. When you search for that, what happens? Uh, but I've also worked on things like search UI. I worked on assistant. I worked on technical things like knowledge graph. Um, and I think in terms of growth, right? Like I, I, as you mentioned, I've had sort of a very traditional sort of PM sort of growth since I've been on search, I'd say. Like before that, I moved around a lot. I had a lot of variety in terms of, of domains. I, it's always almost like being in many different companies within within Google. Um, on search, I've sort of, uh, I've just grown teams. So, so you know, I started as, as um, I started as an individual contributor. Uh, I, I, for a while, I used to manage before. I went back to being an individual contributor. Then I managed, you know, uh, PMs. Then I managed managers of PMs. Uh, and and as you sort of do that, like you sort of you adjust uh, the skills you require as a manager and the things that you need to do are a little different, but you sort of still have the same sort of PM framework. Hey, thanks, thanks for uh, enlightening us with your journey as such. I think most of our learners would really like to have a similar kind of a journey in future. Uh, let me look into a few more questions, right? I think uh, Navin Verma is asking. Okay, let me just check. So Navin is trying to ask, right? What are the most pertinent questions to ask when mm -hmm. defining your product strategy, right? So what are the most pertinent questions when you define your strategy? I, I think I'll go back to, uh, I really like, so actually make me, it'll, it'll help to go through the examples, okay. right? So I really like sort of both. Uh, so let me walk through both of them. Uh, so Adam Nash's question, right? Like, what is the game you're playing and how are you keeping score, right? I think it's a great question, which is, so the pertinent question to ask when you write your product strategy is, is you have to say, you have to have this notion of like, why will our team build this? Why are we going to do this? And why do I think this will work? Uh, and you should be very clear on what your objective metrics are. Are you trying to make money? Are you trying to grow users so that later at some point you can make money? Um, I think you have to write down why you think you will win and what does that mean? So I think Gibson Biddle goes like a net, a level deeper, right? Which is he said, how will you delight your consumer in hard to sort of copy margin enhancing ways? So to me, those are the questions, right? Like you have to say delight customers, right? If you're set, and by the way, this applies across industries. If you're, you're building a SaaS product, why will someone buy your thing and not the other thing? Like what are they giving up? Yeah. Uh, and and the reason delight is important is especially if you're going to an entrenched market, right? Like people are using something already or doing things a certain way. What is it that you're doing that is so amazing that they will stop doing it that way and go to this? Because one of the things, uh, it's true for both consumer products and enterprise products, it's really hard to get people to change their habits. So the first thing, you know, when we delight consumers is why will people change their habits? So that's the first thing you should answer. The second thing is hard to copy, right? Especially if you're in a very competitive space. Why is the thing you're doing hard for someone else to copy? Um, a lot of startups assume, you know, sort of the question means, oh, you know, I'm going to do this. Uh, this big company can add this feature because they have more engineers or they have more money or whatever. That's really the case. I find it's most like other similar sized things that are able to sort of copy the thing that you're doing. Uh, so I find the reason you have to have some something that makes it hard, or at least gives you a lead in the market, right? Sometimes it can be technology. Sometimes it can be sort of some insight that you have. Sometimes it can just be like, okay, we're, we're going to build this really fast and we're going to lock people in or whatever it is. So you have to have that hard to copy answer. Uh, and finally, you know, the margin and you have to understand your economics, right? Right. Which is what is it that you're doing that, you know, you don't have to make money right away. Right. But you have to understand, like, what is my eventual plan so that I'm profitable, so that I'm returning money at the rate? You know, again, that economics is different if you're your own company. It's, an, it's different if you've taken venture fund, funding and so you've got some milestones to hit. 
So the answer changes with each of those, but you have to understand your economics and say, how is this enhancing my margins? And then how is that what I need? So to me, those three things are the most important questions when you're defining your product strategy. Um, now, to, in order to do that, you have to do the standard things, you know, like you have to understand your market, you have to understand your users, you have to understand your competition, all of that stuff. But to me, those are the three questions, questions you really need to answer. So one is nobody should copy it. Second is the economics. And what is the first one? Like why we are building it? Like, that's one. The first one is why, yeah, basically Somebody why are you would take how it. will you delight your customers, right? Oh, why is right. it that like your customers would go like, yeah, this is what I want oh, oh. Uh, versus like, you know, anything else. So it's both, uh, it's both like, why are we building it? And why, why will people care that we're building it, I guess? Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. So let me check any other questions we have. Like Kavita is asking, uh, so she's a practicing product manager, right? So she's, she's really liked your presentation. She's appreciating that. She's asking that as a practicing product manager, right? I would like to know uh, how, what and how we implement lessons learned from a product that did not go as planned, right? So she's citing an yeah. example of Google Glasses, right? She's saying that that did not yep. go well. So she just won't understand that. Yeah, no, that's a great example. I think, um, so, so I'll give you practical stuff, but but also general advice, right? Which is always when things fail, uh, it's important to be open about the failure, acknowledge it, and then say, okay, what have we learned? Um, so Google's had a lot of products, right? That sort of have, have gone through that. Like I remember, um, oh man, I'm even blanking out on the name now. Uh, we had this, wow, that's how, uh, let me, let me pull the name of that thing. Uh, we, we had a product uh, that, so let me, let me step back. And so let, let's use the Google Glass example. I'm going to find, remember the name of that product that failed. Uh, it was a collaboration tool we had. Um, uh, but um, uh, the first thing to do is debug why it failed, right? And be not be in the mode of blaming people and teams, but sort of having sort of genuine, like, okay, why did this not work? Was it the market was off? Did a, was our product development off? Did we, like Glass, you know, I think we can assume a number of reasons why it failed. Like I, I, it sort of tried to go consumer too early. The, you can sort of bring the, the form design, all of those things. Uh, I'm not close enough to, bring, to, the, to the team to know, but like I, I, I did talk to a few people that were on the product at the time. They all had their opinion. Um, but I think the main thing is sort of saying, okay, what happened? What went wrong? And what can we learn so that we can try it again? Um, so at least on most products that I work with, right, it's almost important to fail fast uh, because very rarely will be will most features that you try, will most things that you work actually sort of work right away. Uh, so this is almost a question of failing a few times before you get there. Um, I gave the photos example, right? Like we had a photo strategy a few different times, right? So uh, there used to be Picasso Web. Uh, then there used to be Google Plus Photos, which we sort of became Google Photos. And each of these cases, the product didn't work. Uh, a lot of the people sort of moved, moved through the project, all of these. They kind of said, okay, what didn't work? What can we learn? What can we do better next time? Um, so I think that's the main thing. So there are some tactical things. So on most projects that aren't working, uh, or even like features that fail, like I asked my teams, like, hey, write a postmortem. More from the point of view of okay, what went wrong? What do we think went wrong? And based on that, what can we, what have we learned, and what can we do differently? Um, an ideal scenario, by the way, is is you don't, you, it never gets to a post mortem, but you kind of test constantly, right? So, I, I, I have, a, a, I don't do this, but I have a peer who basically plans a what went wrong meeting after every launch. Uh, and I was like, Hey, why don't you have it before the launch so that, you know, you can make sure it doesn't go wrong. He's like, no, no, no. Things always go wrong. You just have to have like, a he books the meeting, you know, two weeks afterwards, okay. which is like some things will go wrong. And so let's understand what we've actually done. Um, and so I think that's really important. Uh, but like not, I think the downside is if you look at failure as a way to blame people and teams and say like, Oh, you know, you didn't think about this enough. That's why it failed. And, and. I think instead look at it as a way to sort of step back and like take lessons away so that you can try it again. Because honestly, sometimes the best people to make something work the second time are the people that live through it the first time and understand technology and understand users uh, in a deep way. 
yeah the failure is the first stepping stone for success like that's what they say and yeah thanks thanks for uh, thanks for answering that satyajit so you just want to understand right in your team like you would be at google at a senior level right you would be uh, interviewing and recruiting multiple product manager at an entry level right so quite a few yep. audience at an entry level quite a few learners they would like to really understand right what are the skill sets that they should develop and how to develop that to get into those kind of roles as such what should they work on and what are the things that you are looking for while hiring people in your team like yeah so i'd say um once you're a product manager the thing that really distinguishes some of the most successful ones are and you have to communicate this in the interview as well is this notion of of um you know internally what we call, like i think a lot of people call it grit or perseverance right which is um there was this idea like at google initially they did this test in the first few years of google and they found that startup founders were the best pms at google and the reason they found was you know startup founders are all used to people saying no to them and still finding a way to get things done like in the chaos right and i think that to me is a really important skill set of a good product manager which is they used to hearing no they're able to prioritize and they don't they're fairly persistent with things that they really believe in uh so to me like that grit seeing that somewhere in an interview is really important right so so i'd say that's one part once you have a job the other things you look at are does this person actually care about products and do they think about it deeply right so i ask questions like you know some of my most simple questions are like hey what's a product you like and why do you like it right and it's something as simple as that which is you get a sense of does does this person think about the product right does he or she like if they like you know an app fine tell me that you like the app but can you tell me why can you tell me why it's better than the competition can you tell me what part of it delighted you um so i think having that level of like analysis and curiosity about those things is really important so i think to me grit combined with sort of just intellectual curiosity in general but particularly about products uh is really important because the reality is like this the especially at at a big company like google we hire generalists right so uh it's really important that we're able to take the person like someone like someone like me sort of I, i've actually worked on at least you know internet related product but there are friends who you know are working on youtube one day they're working on ads after that then they go work on health right so it's very different domains and so you need to be able to like learn quickly make good assumptions and so that curiosity is really important and that grit is really important and how would you what what do you suggest about these programs right the different programs on product management even upgrad as a program in product management yep. with duke right which is one of the top most universities right like so do you think that these programs help help them build those skills those kind of thinking as such which would help them get into those kind of roles like i mean i i think so i think all education is really important right so so the thing i i always say is is you have to keep upskilling yourself and you have to keep learning things right so i think i the thing i would say is is finding opportunities to upskill yourself is really important and so yeah like finding the right opportunities uh that work for you that work for the time that you have and all of that is 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 key and by the way it's a lifelong right so yeah. even once you get your first product management job the reality is to get your next one which may be in a different field or whatever you have to keep learning um so finding those opportunities for learning is 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 really important even even after reaching at this level do you still invest time in education and upskilling yourself like do you still do that i i do uh so i i and at different things you're like like learning different skills right so i think it's anything from uh sometimes it's a domain right like you have to learn a new domain because it's an important one um uh, early on right i needed i realized oh my design skills are are not where i want them to be so i i had to take specific things there uh sometimes it's functional things right like you want to learn sort of uh like okay how do i communicate better how do i coach people better um and so and then i think i you end up hopefully you 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 want to read a lot as well right so there are lots of people that like you know write really well about product strategy about um um like like you know sort of just how to think about product how to manage people and so i spend a lot of time sort of reading and and thinking about those spaces um it, it's i would say especially once you start your career right like 
you have to you have to spend time at work because obviously you got to make the thing successful right but you have to spend a significant amount of time on yourself and making yourself better uh and i think you know i i wish i spent more uh, oh. and i think that's one thing i'll tell tell sort of everyone that's that sort of in the audience and watching is you you have to budget time for that and it's really hard because you know you think oh i've got my job how do i find time for it but you have to find ways to do it uh uh because you know that's the only way to sort of grow in your career important I think there are quite a few questions which are pouring in, but I think in the interest of time, we'll take one last question. Would that be okay, Satyajit? It's already we are exceeding yeah. your time. Uh, yeah, Naveen yeah, no. wants to yeah. ask one more question. He's saying, "How to convince leadership, right, to invest in your product strategy?" Like, uh, so that's so, what Naveen wants to. Know. Yeah, 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 no. This is so. This is one of the things uh, I ended with. It, it's leadership is ultimately people. right so and a large yeah a, a large part of this is you know, in big companies you have to understand and, and by the way this is one of the most important parts of being a product manager in general you have to learn to convince people uh, which generally means building relationships and understanding their incentives uh so i think that means asking like a big company like like samsung like right samsung, so samsung yeah I, yeah i'd say irrespective of the company right so there's a cultural aspect and there is an incentive aspect and the incentive aspect is you know who do you need to convince and what do they care about like do you understand that right do you understand like how they are gold which may be different from the way you're gold by the way right like you know you may want to build a great product and care about users but that person may have you know i just want to meet a revenue man or like sometimes by the way you have to understand that companies are different right like sometimes people like you as a product manager may care about one thing your engineering partner may care about oh i just need to get my engineers promoted so you need to ship something next quarter right it's a very tactical nothing to do with consumers thing but your job as a product manager is to take you know those incentives and merge it with what you care about and so i think it's similarly all the way up right like does you have to understand what leadership cares about do they care about reputation do they care about revenue do they just sometimes as simple as like you know i'm a very senior let's let's say vp or whatever and i want this other senior vp to see that i'm doing something good and so then you have to think about that uh so i would say the answer is put yourself in the mind of whoever you're trying to influence and understand what their incentives are but if you don't understand their incentives then you have no chance of convincing them um and the reality is i think especially if it's If there's a cultural difference, or like you you aren't close to those people, you don't understand their incentives completely. So I'd say that's the part you should figure out. You know, ask others like, what does this person care about? How do I convince him or her? Um, get a clear sense of that because ultimately, you know, companies are people, and I think people there like may care about similar things, but you've got to like figure out what their influence things are. You know, what what do they what do they want, and what are they worried about? What are they worried about is also as important, right? Like. They, sometimes you know they just don't want a project to fail and so then you got to think about it in, in different terms uh so those are the things to sort of always keep in mind yeah thanks thanks for that i hope uh, navin's question got oh, answered anand i can't hear you can you hear me now hello now i can can you hear me hello yeah yeah now i can okay okay yeah, i was just saying thanks a lot thanks a lot for answering because i think navin would be satisfied in thanking you as well for a wonderful answer so i think that's it from our side like so you thanks a lot for taking your wonderful time for the session and i am very sure that each of our learner has learned a lot from your session and they would go out as a much educated and much learned on this field as product management it's still a vast field so uh, yep. you would not be able to cover that much in one hour but yeah thanks for the lovely insights uh, thank you lot thanks a lot for your valuable time uh, satyaji any any last thank you, advice thank that you, you want to give to us was... oh sorry go ahead Pardon? Uh, sorry, I just missed out on that one. Oh no, I just said thank you for inviting me. I really enjoyed it. Okay, okay, thanks a lot. So, guys, uh, 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 thanks a lot for attending this wonderful session. As you would be aware that if you really want to kickstart your career in this uh, dynamic field, in-demand field of product management, right? Upgrade also has a program uh, with Duke, a product management and strategy, right? Uh, Duke is probably uh, the top four colleges in the entire world as such. You can enroll for that, and definitely you will have such industry experts, right? someone like satyajit similar experts coming and teaching you that course in the recorded sessions or a live interactive sessions we would be having international experts uh, coming and delivering those sessions and we are starting our international batch right 
where, would, where there would be learners from different parts of the country, from Singapore, from Australia, from US, UK, Middle East, South Africa, right? You would be a part of that batch starting on 30th of September. If, if you're really interested, you can visit our website and go through the program page as such, and you can share your details. And somebody from our team will connect with you uh, uh, and counsel you for the same, right? I think that's it from our end. Once again, Satyajit, thanks a lot for your wonderful time. And all of our blessed, all of us are blessed to have you with us. Like, thank you. No, thank you. Thanks for the invitation. I really enjoyed it. Thanks, thanks. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.